So I've been recently going through some comic book movies with a couple friends, one of which people who follow the channel already know of, and another one named Stir. SK has already made a video on Black Panther 1 and the many issues present within that movie, and as someone who liked Wakanda Forever when I first watched it, then rewatched it and realized, okay, this movie's got some big problems, then rewatched it again a couple days ago and I realized it's got even more problems. <laughs> so I decided to make a follow-up video to SK's going through the movie. Remember, if you disagree with anything said in this video, you can come on to my Disagreement Day streams hosted by me and SK every week or so make sure to join my discord in the description to stay updated on when we do them or you can join my discord and dm me about it and before i'm called racist in my comment section for disliking this movie i need you all to remember something he gotta be mixed that's what i think he gotta be mixed bro this man the kid got nostrils like a you can't tell me he's not mixed that's a right there those are nostrils daddy or mom gotta be gotta be black bro those are nostrils i don't know double a when i see them i know double a when i see them those are nostrils. His dad or his mom is black. Whether or not he chooses to admit it or identify as such, those are nostrils. I know them. Okay? I know my own. This is a nick right here. Okay? <laughs> Jokes aside, let's get into the biggest problem in this movie, which the plot heavily relies on. And that issue is the Namor problem. <laughs> Namor is quite honestly the worst villain in the entire MCU. His motives are completely nonsensical to anyone with a brain. His plans throughout the movie are brain dead to say the least. And he takes multiple actions throughout the movie that contradict his goal of keeping his society hidden. But let's get into it piece by piece. So Namor pulls up on a beach where the Queen and Shuri are talking. And he immediately starts acting hostile for absolutely no reason. He immediately tries to force Wakanda into doing something that's completely unreasonable in helping him kill this scientist. And there are multiple problems with this character already. <laughs> First of all, what does getting the scientists from America even accomplish for Namor? He is genuinely so stupid that he believes that they wouldn't back up the blueprints for the fucking device. And why don't Shuri or Ramonda appeal to this simple logic either? And on top of that, Namor threatening to wage war with Wakanda could not only get the government involved, but also, um, the fucking Avengers? <laughs> which easily would get Namor and his people discovered. Then he tells them not to spread the word to anyone outside of Wakanda, not realizing that all it would take is one stupid kid within Wakanda, with access to a cell phone, to get him exposed. <laughs> I think the line of him saying anyone outside of Wakanda can't know is a bit of a nitpick, but it's just a weird line of dialogue because if one person from Wakanda spreads the word, that that just, you know. But anyways, I don't mind Wakanda not calling the Avengers currently at this point in the movie, but later in the movie, this will become a massive issue. But to top this part of the movie off with another massive issue in the world building, the Vibranium Detectors have literally already been established a year before the events of this damn movie. In WandaVision, it's established that they have the capabilities to detect Vibranium. So how am I supposed to believe that this hasn't been used by the US government already throughout the course of a whole year? Then onto the next part where we see the Taliconians. I don't know if that's how you refer to them plurally, so for the duration of this video, I'm just gonna call them the water people. We should find the fishman and kill him. Anyways, this doesn't necessarily fall onto Namor, but it does fall onto the people in his culture who have the exact same goals as him. They pull up on Shuri, Riri, and Okoye on this bridge after this chase. First of all, how the hell did these guys even find them right now? Second of all, all these people are genuinely so brain dead that they want to stay hidden, yet this guy drags out a fight for a long time, which prolongs him being there, which further risks them being discovered by the government, drones, satellites, or the police. And as Okoye starts the fight with the other water people, this big guy is just sitting there in the back, literally just standing there. <laughs> Then he tries to kill Riri after Okoye already beat all the other water people. Like, what the fuck? Your whole mission is to kill the scientist and to stay hidden. You're doing a terrible job on both fronts. How fucking stupid are you? This is also plot armor for Okoye because she should also be dead right now if it wasn't for this guy being a moron. Then Shuri wakes up and asks for both her and Riri to be taken to Namor alive. But why do these people accept it? Like, genuinely, why? As soon as Shuri asks, they're just like, oh, yeah, okay, okay. They were completely fine with killing her a second ago, and now they have a sudden change of heart for what the film shows as little to no reason. They don't know if this is a trap, they don't know if Shuri or Riri or Okoye are being tracked right now, so this change of heart just comes completely out of nowhere, and it's a high risk. And they don't even take off her Kamoyo beads, which is how Wakanda is able to track them later- okay, never mind. As I was editing this video, I went through back the scene and I saw that they actually did remove her Kamoyo beads, however, they did not remove her earrings or things on her that could be tracked, which is how the queen finds Shuri. So it's still stupid. Then we get into name Namor's backstory, the reason behind his motives, and his grand reason for becoming a villain and wanting to wage war against not only Wakanda, but the entire fucking world. <laughs> and this reason is, drumroll please, slavery. This man held a grudge 
for hundreds of years against the service world and is willing to go through with everything I mentioned earlier because he's too stupid to understand how much the world has changed since then. He thinks just them being discovered will cause the world to like wage war with them and invade them, and he thinks it's the same with Wakanda, despite the fact that not only have the aliens teamed up with humans to save the fucking world, but so is Wakanda, and not a single person in his society challenges this idea, which could have been interesting, but guess what, other than a basic backstory of how they came to be, and what they do now, we get literally nothing that explores their culture with any kind of depth. And on top of that, Wakanda has been public knowledge to not only the government, but the entire world for 8 plus years now, and nobody has invaded Wakanda except for literal aliens that have nothing to do with what this world wants. But guess what? Even in that case, Wakanda was quite literally aiding and teaming up with the fucking Avengers. And not only that, but how does Namor simultaneously think that he can take on the entire world in a war, but at the same time he's scared of slavery and is willing to start a war with Wakanda for little to no reason, and the only reason we get, which I've gone over earlier, is completely fucking brain dead and would risk his society being discovered anyway. Strategic fucking genius. And the defenses I've heard for this are, uh, <laughs> there's something. The first comment we see here, white dude. Okay. <laughs> Didn't know the color of your skin mattered when you're criticizing a movie, but we'll, we'll run with it. I think that Namor believed the re-raid, okay, the vibranium recently and didn't know the US had already made one back in WandaVision. Him holding onto that grudge of the surface world isn't that unreasonable, considering he would be alive to see humanity would be like from the 1500s to now. Now, uh, <laughs> given everything I've already went over, I think for this comment, Goodbye, sir. I will not even dignify that argument with a response. And nothing happened to them. He's referring to Wakanda right now. The first part of the movie is stuff happening to them. Them and their vibranium were being targeted by different governments knowing they can't fight back. I said, that's great, champ. Unfortunately, that's eight years after the world already knew about Wakanda. Which further proves my point. They've been targeting Wakanda for years. Someone just wasn't paying attention. Um, brother, the fuck do you mean this further proves your point? <laughs> We haven't seen literally anyone target Wakanda outside of one single Black Ops team from France, and disregarding the fact that this is another problem with the movie that I will get to later, this happens at the beginning of the fucking movie, which again means Wakanda has been public knowledge for 8 plus years. And Namor also doesn't even mention that he has knowledge of this attack happening to them in the beginning of the movie. He doesn't even use this as a case for his argument at any point in the entire movie. The only reason he planned that attack was because Wakanda revealed themselves and none of this would have happened if Wakanda just stayed quiet. The world was legit preparing to make them an op. Yeah, so this whole comment thread is pretty self-explanatory as the response and rebuttal is right there, so anyways, let's move on. <laughs> anyways, other things we get during this section of the movie is Namor talking to both Shuri and Queen Ramonda. And yet again, neither of them try to appeal to the obvious fact that the Americans could have already duplicated the technology, so killing Riri is ultimately pointless, or the fact that starting a war with Wakanda could reveal them to the world anyway, or the fact that they themselves, Wakanda, haven't been invaded for fucking eight plus years by the world other than one fucking small time by a small black ops group, and guess what? They don't even have to fucking mention that, because Namor doesn't know what happened. <laughs> The efforts that the Wakandans take to avoid this war are so consistently stupid throughout the movie, but that's something we again will get more into later in the video. Then Namor floods Wakanda. <laughs> and I've already explained the other problems within this, but we have even bigger issues present. One, not only does he punch M'Baku and M'Baku somehow is still alive after this. Two, he still wants Riri dead, yet he leaves her there alive after killing Queen Ramonda. Three, he gives Wakanda a fucking week's time to prepare for another fight with Talo Khan. <laughs> <laughs> Once again, not only is this completely fucking stupid, but even if we run with Namor stupidly thinking he would be able to take on the world in a war, why the hell would he give Wakanda a whole week to possibly coordinate with the governments around the world? But, um, also, I don't know, um, the fucking Avengers? <laughs> And this doesn't really have anything to do with Namor, but I guess I might as well point this out now. Wakanda stupidly literally doesn't do anything before this, but also after this, they barely take any preparations for the attack that they know is about to happen. They don't even upgrade their security to stop Namor from breaking in the same way he did last time. Then we move on to the final battle of the movie, which has a shit ton of problems, but we'll get on to that stuff later. But not only is Namor struggling with taking on a small Wakandan army, but he's also struggling in a fight with a weaker Iron Man and fucking Black Panther. 
brother, who's on the same level as, like, Captain America. And Shuri is an even less capable fighter than T'Challa. But I think this really puts into perspective how fucking dumb it is that Namor even has the idea in his head that he would be able to take on the world. Let's take a look at all the Avengers slash superheroes alone in the MCU at this current state that Namor should reasonably know about. Strange and the Sorcerers, Thor, Valkyrie, and New Asgard, Wakanda, Spider-Man, Captain America and the Winter Soldier, Hulk, War Machine, Hawkeye, and Scarlet Witch. And before anyone mentions the events of Multiverse of Madness, uh, there's no fucking way that Namor would have possibly known about that. Anyways, there's multiple characters here that alone would be enough to solo Namor in his entire fucking society. And this is without mentioning the militaries and military technology around the world. Like, what the hell is Namor even gonna do against a nuke? Well, I guess the end of the movie answers that question. Bro got taken out by a fucking air fryer. Which, I also want to point out, something else I don't like before moving on. But the way Namor gets taken out at the end is just so fucking lame. The final fight between him and Shuri is so fucking ass, even from an action perspective. Maybe not ass, but it's just very mid. Then, in the final scene we get with Namor, he has, I guess, a moment of change where he uses his brain for the first time in the movie for a second. He realizes that instead of trying to fight Wakanda, he can now use them as an ally and stay hidden still. Wow, what a fucking realization, Namor. <laughs> If only there was a way to easily figure this out at the beginning of the movie. If only other characters would have used their brains to explain this to you, Namor. But guess what? He still doesn't even fully change because he still thinks now that him and Wakanda are teamed up that they could take on the world. <sighs> And he also doesn't come to the simple realization that slavery pretty much doesn't exist anymore. But I guess that's too much to ask from someone so fucking stupid. <laughs> now let's get into the problems surrounding the characters and the overall plot. First of all, the French Black Ops team breaking into one of the Wakandan vaults. How the fuck did these guys break into this lab? This means that Wakanda either has very shitty security for this facility, which makes them look stupid, but I'm assuming the facility has security and is made out of vibranium and has vibranium weapons. So I really don't know how the hell these guys even managed to break into this place. Then, moving on, Shuri, Okoye, and the Queen are talking about the vibranium detector, and for some reason they're surprised by the fact that the Americans were able to make a vibranium detector. Um, yes, I don't- I don't know if you know this, but giving America access to your technology through helping them might entail that making something to track the material would be possible, even though it already has been made, and, uh, they should know this, but I, I digress. They then go to have a talk with Ross, and I don't know why this movie and the first movie are just so fine with calling Ross a colonizer. They call him this shit for literally no reason other than the fact that I guess he's white and is from America. They don't call anyone else this, like Killmonger, for example, even when they think he's from America, or Claw, or Steve, or Bucky. Even though, to be fair, I don't know if Claw's from America. I don't, I don't think he is. But Steve and Bucky still stand. So would, like, Tony Stark and, you know, other Avengers and stuff. Like, you know what I'm saying. But I'm genuinely confused why they do this with Ross. Even at the end of the movie, Aquae is like, a colonizer in chains I never thought I would see the day. And I'm just sitting here like, what? <laughs> Imagine if they put this kind of connotation on any other race, just because they've had negative attachments to their country or nationality's history. It's just strange to me why there's a double standard with this. But anyways, on to even bigger problems in this moment. Ross is told by Shuri that Wakanda wasn't the one who did the attack on the boat. And for some reason, despite knowing that Wakanda is a good nation that wouldn't kill innocent people like that and even mentioning this later to his own government, how he thinks of Wakanda, he still for some reason assumed they did this attack for for some reason, which just feels completely out of character for him. And when going to get Riri, Shuri and Okoye completely changed the plan of bringing the scientist to Namor after saying that it was only a 19-year-old kid who made the device. And I'm just sitting here like, what the fuck? What's the difference between a 19-year-old college kid and a 30-year-old? This implies that they wouldn't have changed if it was an older person, which also feels completely out of character for Shuri and Okoye. And then Shuri wants to remain discreet, yet judging by how easily Riri recognizes her, we can tell she's something of a public figure in the world. So I don't know why Shuri takes her glasses off when walking to Riri's room. That part of it's not that big of an issue, I agree, but it is just weird. Also, if Ross and the government know about this kid, why don't they just confirm front her non-aggressively at her school? This is on top of the fact that later in the film she says there's a whole YouTube account dedicated to spottings of her in her Iron Man suit, yet for some reason the government does nothing about this. Look at how the government reacted with Iron Man, and this was with S.H.I.E.L.D. covering his tracks, at the time when they needed to. Yet for some reason now in the MCU, when they have even better surveillance technology, they just now so happen to find her at this point in the movie. And when they do, they start immediately acting hostile and going to question her, for literally 
literally no reason. Also, if the government used her design to track Vibranium, and they want to make more of these devices, once again, why would they have not already approached Riri for a job about this? Then we get to this car chase, and for some reason, Riri decides to carpet bomb a bunch of innocent cops. <laughs> <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> All right. <laughs> and I know that the cops ran away, but in this scene, you can clearly tell that Riri doesn't care if she hits them or not, and they're just doing their job. <laughs> and I've already talked about the other problems within this sequence of the movie in the Namor section of the video, so moving on. Queen Ramonda is informed that Shuri was taken by the water people, and for some stupid fucking reason, she decides to fire Okoye, even though she literally was placed into a 1v4 fight with superhumans? The fuck we talking about? Fire all of them! Clean house! Fucking garbage ass team. Even after Shuri gets taken back to Wakanda from Namor's place, the queen still doesn't even apologize to Okoye. There's no resolution with this. The film doesn't seem to think that what she's doing right now is wrong, so I can't even accept the defense that, oh, she's just emotional in the moment, even though she would literally need Okoye for the impending war and conflict that's arising. And Ramonda also only just now starts tracking Shuri's Kamoyo beads the next day. Then her stupid ass decides to get Nakia to come along on the mission to get Shuri back, and instead of trying to negotiate peacefully before the infiltration mission, she sends Nakia in there, which would just start a conflict. <laughs> And Nakia just goes in there guns blazing pretty much instead of trying to be stealthy when saving Shuri, which makes her kill one of the water people, leading into the stupidity from Namor, which we've already talked about. But I also don't know how the fuck Nakia was even able to get here without being spotted, but whatever. Then Namor attacks Wakanda, Queen Ramonda is just sitting in her throne room. <laughs> she doesn't move to somewhere safer for some reason, and when he starts attacking the window to the room she's in, they don't even run away. Like, <laughs> my god. And after this attack, the news somehow knows Queen Ramonda is dead, and something I also forgot to mention is the fact that the US is about to start a war with Wakanda until Ross talks them down from it, all because they think Wakanda might have attacked one of their vessels. Why the fuck are they trying to start a war with Wakanda right now, without even trying to be diplomatic first, or actually figuring out for sure if they actually did this attack? Also, this lady from Falcon and the Winter Soldier, I, I forget her name, <laughs> literally has Ross's conversation with Queen Ramonda bugged, yet during the conversation with Ross, Ramonda mentions that there was another party involved, so how the fuck does this lady not know that Wakanda isn't the only suspect for this attack? And also, why is Ross being charged for treason despite her having that information? Then Shuri remakes the heart-shaped herb, and despite the fact that they know they're about to fight a bunch of superhumans and Namor, she doesn't supply other people with these abilities for some fucking reason. She instead only gives Okoye and Nakia suits that give them superhuman strength, and I can understand the whole there's only supposed to be one black Black Panther thing, da 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 But this is a threat worse than anything they've ever seen before, and they don't even know if they can win this alone. Outside of maybe the Infinity War battle, but obviously they didn't have the heart-shaped herb at that point. And even if they did, they have the fucking Avengers fighting with them in that fight. And obviously, fucking Wakanda still hasn't even called the Avengers yet on their part in this scenario, <laughs> but we've already gone over how stupid that is. Then, when talking things over with the Wakandan council, these people in this council are so fucking stupid. <laughs> First of all, one of them says we don't know how to find them, despite the fact that Nakia literally went to Talokan. Then another one of them says you are calling for Namor's head when his only crime was intimidation. <laughs> <laughs> Do I even need to explain how fucking stupid that is to the person watching this video right now? This is quite literally the single dumbest line of dialogue I have ever heard in my entire 20 years and 10 months on this earth. And nobody even remarks at the dumb shit either of these people just said. Not even Shuri when Namor just murdered her fucking mom. <laughs> then we move on to the final battle and their plan to capture Namor. There are so many issues with this final battle despite it being a pretty cool set piece. Number one, their grand plan to capture the god of the seas <laughs> is to go into the middle of the ocean. Just let that sink in for a second. Their plan to fight the water people is to go into the middle of the ocean. <laughs> they use some sound wave device to try and disorient the Talo uh, the, the water people, <laughs> even though that they know Talokan literally has the technology to destroy this thing. 
So, I... Uh, also, why would they not use the frequency that disoriented the vibranium in Black Panther 1? Since they know the water people are using vibranium? This wouldn't even affect them either, since it's in the water, and they could have just used a different material for the ship. The second problem with this is Shuri implements flight tech into the power armor for Okoye and Nakia, yet doesn't do the same for her Black Panther suit. Okay. The third problem is Shuri's plan to kill Namor is to put him in a fucking air fryer instead of, I don't know, just, um, burning him alive <laughs> with something like a flamethrower similar to what she does at the end of the fight. <laughs> and yes, I understand that they're draining the water in his cells or whatever, and it's probably really hot in that little box, and I understand that Namor is weakened throughout the fight, but Shuri doesn't even attempt this. Why don't they just have a bunch of vibranium bullets that just shoot at Namor when he's inside the heat room? H he's dead. If they do that, he's fucking dead. <laughs> the fourth problem is, for some reason, Okoye and Nakia just so happen to show up later in this fight. Where the fuck were you this whole time? <laughs> and then the fifth and final problem. At the end of the fight, Shuri just fucking lets Namor go, despite the fact that he could just come back and start another war, and come back even stronger this time with more of his army. And I can hear some people saying, oh, well, if they captured Namor, then this would start a war anyway. Okay, and if Talokan tries to do that, then say you will kill Namor if they even try, and explain to them, that you don't want to start a war, but Namor's gonna have to spend time in prison for his crimes, and the lack of trust that they should have with him at this point. This would be like at the end of Civil War, that after, you know, T'Challa accepts his revenge bad arc, he's just like, yeah, go ahead, Zemo, you're free to go, man. You know, you, we, don't, we don't need you anymore. It's, you know, you can go. <laughs> but sure, he does this with someone who's an even bigger threat, but okay. Anyways, before Namor and Shuri of our arrive to, like, stop the fight that's going on, despite the fact that there's, like, 10 to 20 Wakandan soldiers left, the water people are just slowly backing them down instead of, I don't know, throwing more water bombs or throwing their spears or using guns, which for some reason, the water people haven't created guns yet for some undisclosed reason, <laughs> which is stupid in and of itself, but whatever. And despite the fact that Riri, Okoye, and Nakia can all fly right now and shoot at them, they are sitting there holding their ground for some fucking reason and not really doing shit to fight back. And the other Wakandans aren't firing the projectiles from their spears either. I, this movie is something else. As I was going through the final battle again, I noticed even more issues. <laughs> First of all, Namor has the drop on Shuri, and instead of going to recharge in the water and then going to fight Shuri, he just sneak attacks her. Second of all, we know the water people have the ability to mind control people into offing themselves, and they don't try to do that at all in this fight. And third, the Wakandans have invisibility tech, and I don't- I feel like the movie really needs to disclose this. I will go in in good faith and be like, oh, maybe they can't miniaturize the tech. It's very unbelievable to me that with all the technology and the advancements that Wakanda has made, that they haven't found a way to miniaturize this. Again, I can go in in good faith and be like, yeah, maybe they can't miniaturize it this small yet, but it's just a little weird that the movie doesn't explain this, because it would be such a massive advantage to have in combat. Then to wrap things up with the movie, for some reason they are still doing trial by combat to see who their leader will be, and I'll just let SK explain this one because he already has in his video on why this is stupid. A major issue in the world building is the way in which Wakanda chooses its leader. So Wakanda has a challenge day, where the king is decided through trial by combat, meaning that the strongest fighter, who could easily be really stupid or really evil, is going to be the one ruling Wakanda. The go-to defense I've seen for this is that the movie is about challenging traditions and accepting changes to the system. Now, here's why that doesn't really work. In Captain America Civil War, T'Challa was already chosen as the Black Panther, while his older and less abled father is leading the country as their king. That means King T'Chaka himself acknowledges that while he isn't the best suited to fight, he's the best suited to lead. He himself understands the distinction, yet in the decades he spent as the king of Wakanda, he kept this law in place without any attempt to change this tradition. A tradition based in ideas that he himself doesn't believe in or follow. There's zero consistency in that decision. Furthermore, allowing this law to stick goes against his entire position on the Accords. King T'Chaka signed the Accords under the belief that the Avengers needed to practice restraint because of how powerful they are. He doesn't think the Avengers should be making these executive decisions without supervision, which means he believes that being the most powerful heroes in the world does not make them the most qualified decision makers. Yes, I'm glad we agree. So why does he run his nation? under the basis of maintaining tradition, which is the go-to defense people make for this. I understand that's the theme of the movie, but... When stolen Wakandan vibranium was used to make a terrible weapon, 
We in Wakanda were forced to question our legacy. Goodwill mission from a country too long in the shadows. We will fight to improve the world we wish to join. So this means that King T'Chaka himself, who was T'Challa's main inspiration, who was already challenging Wakandan traditions on the basis of the events of Age of Ultron, where their vibranium was stolen by Ultron, which nearly destroyed the entire world, he already believed they needed to step out of the shadows, question their legacy, and start improving the world with what they have to offer. Civil War very clearly set this up, but this movie dropped it. So the entire theme of this movie is pointless because they already would have been making changes to their system back in 20. 15, and the world building hinges on a massive character assassination of King T'Chaka. And now in Wakanda Forever, you can apparently just have someone sub in for you, which is just like, you know what, never mind. <sighs> Before I close things off, talking about what I actually do like about the movie, I just want to say that if you enjoyed this and would like to support me even further and get access to the comic I'm currently working on, I would appreciate it if you would head to my Patreon and help a brother out for as little as $1 a month. As far as what I like about the movie though, well, I like Shuri's character arc, even if she does do some dumb shit in the movie. I love Umbaku as a character, he still remains my favorite character within these two movies. The CGI, the set designs, costume and makeup, acting performances and music are all great as well, but none of that saves this movie from its abysmal writing throughout. I hope you all enjoyed this video, and uh, yeah.